reptiles and amphibians. Those groups of animals that bask lazily in the sun and swim in our waterways the world over. Or at least they used to. These charismatic little beasties are unfortunately on the decline, here in Britain especially. Populations of frogs and toads alone have decreased as much as 68% in the last 30 years. Among the worst contributors to this loss are habitat destruction, pollution, and intensive agriculture. Today I met with the extraordinary group, Celtic Reptile and Amphibian, an organization determined to help reverse this decline in these animals and reintroduce species lost here not so long ago. I'm joined by Harvey Tweets, herpetological expert, rewilding advocate, and co-founder of Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. Right, Harvey, thank you for having us today. No worries, great to meet you. It's been an absolute pleasure, isn't it? And the, the weather as well has just been perfect. brilliant. Yeah. Probably a hot day so far. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. perfect reptile amphibian moment. <laughs> yes, definitely, yeah, yeah. Right, so, what inspired you to begin this entire thing? Um, oh, how far do we want to go? I think right at the very start, and I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me, Scott, you have an interest in nature as a child, and you never really know where it comes from. The one thing I can remember is that maybe 10, 11, you realise that things are not actually as rosy as what the childhood books make out, and that we are suffering from climate change, from extinction and biodiversity loss. And it is kind of quite sad to start to actually become aware of these global issues that threaten it's almost um, a curse of knowledge exactly. sometimes. Yeah. You know, as, as a teenager, I guess what I was trying to do was what can I actually do to try and help in some small way. Um, and for me, it was the most hand on, hands-on way I can help is, is through putting animals back in the wild. And I followed a dream, which is to specialise in reintroductions and rewilding of animals. Um, ever since I learnt the term rewilding, which was probably maybe even 2009, maybe that that far back. Um, for me, I couldn't keep bears or wolves in the garden or bison or wild boar or anything. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but what I could do is keep reptiles and amphibians because I'd already kept um, exotic species in the house. So I had a, a, a knowledge from an early age about how to keep these animals. So I started to acquire contacts and, and started to, to gain lots of animals that, that very quickly proliferated and started to breed to the point where the garden was, was, was too small, it wasn't big enough for these animals. So we moved down onto this area of land with the help of money um, from some key environmentalists and also for a lot of help from family and friends who helped to build this up you know, with us. And rewilding, you know, feels like, you know, I think it's definitely us to a fresher breath air when, Absolutely. you know, we almost feel like we're drowning. So, so yeah, I guess what inspires me is to get something done, is to do stuff. Um, and it's also, you know, from a very young age of just being obsessed with, with all manner of different creatures. It, it's really that simple, you know, like so many other people. I can definitely identify with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. What have we got here? So in here we've got the moor frog, um, and this is one of two groups that we have on site. So the moor frog is it's got its, its massive distribution, all from sort of France all the way to Siberia. So it's it's like a pan-global species almost, um, and it used to be in Britain. So we've got evidence from sort of the ninth century of, of sort of sub-fossil remains of moor frogs in the UK in the fens. And the Fens and Broads region of East Anglia, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is, is a very special area because it's climatically more similar to continental Europe, so places like France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, than it is to sort of the rest of the UK. It feels different and it just looks completely different. Um, and that's why this species would have been here originally, is because it's, it's just got a different climate for this, for this animal. The special thing about moor frogs as well is the males in the breeding season go completely blue. And that's, it's, it's a build up of a chemical called lymph in, the, in their skin. And we don't, I mean the specifics are not yet worked out by science, it's a bit of an, an enigma. 
uh, but we think it's got something to do with attracting females in order for the males to mate because the bluer males seem to get more attention by females. So, I mean, in Sweden and places where they still exist today, uh, it's a massive tourist attraction because all these blue frogs look like aliens which have fallen out of the sky <laughs> just lining these lakes and it's just absolutely unbelievable. We knew it was here um, and it was just one of these species that's so small it would have just slipped away into extinction when we drained the fens back in the 16th century, let's say. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, getting off to a good start <laughs> with these guys. But yeah, it's a bit like Jurassic Park, you didn't see the dinosaurs. The Dilophosaurus <laughs> is in there yeah. somewhere, I swear. So, um, when did you guys open? Like, you and your colleague, yeah. when did you guys start this? Yeah, so Tom's currently probably absolutely, completely drunk because he's watching <laughs> Red Hot Chili Peppers and I hope he's not on any other substances either but uh, <laughs> I will, uh, no comment, no further comment um, it was about a year ago but that doesn't ju do justice to the amount of time that we've both kept reptiles Tom's probably kept reptiles for about four years um, I've kept them since I was nine, so like ten years so between us there's almost fifteen years worth of experience of these species um, so yeah, there's been a lot of research leading up to this and again the word research doesn't really do it justice because it's, it's like experimentation, it's reading so much as possible and develop, developing the captive techniques to breed these animals. Um, so it's been a lot of hard work and effort, effort but we, we're starting to feel now a bit more stable, a bit more secure, um, we're doing, economically we're doing quite well and, and working on some great projects um, and yeah it's just starting to feel like the, the moving pieces are just starting to fit in now and, and it's starting to run like a well-oiled machine. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You guys have already accomplished so much in that relatively short time. Yeah, I guess so, but ultimately the planet is still burning. You know, we're still not doing enough. Um, and, and I guess that's, you know, for me, I try, you know, to take something that Derek Gow told me, which is, you got to motivate yourself on the stuff that you haven't done and not the stuff that you've already done so yeah I guess you know reptiles and amphibians are just the start and we're not claiming that reintroducing species like these is going to save the world but a, mi a million tiny actions done right makes a lot of difference so yeah we, we do I, as I say I want to do more reintroductions for the species recently uh, done a reintroduction of water voles just to broaden my knowledge and I'd love to do white storks and beavers so just to just to you know be able to do lots more species to gain a great experience in this field would be amazing you know so absolutely yeah, right. yeah. so you said sand lizards and netajacks are in here yeah so you can see that all, all the planting that's in here we basically took inspiration from um, Formby which won't be far from you. No, I was going to say, yeah. I visited Formby quite yeah, a bit. Yeah. I've never seen a single one of each. <laughs> They're so elusive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's just the heat. I mean, we've seen it today. I think it gets so hot, and that combination with the sand just means that they go into sort of an aver station, which means that they'll basically dig under the ground and just sleep through the hot. Natterjacks are interesting because they are what's known as a pioneer species. So they love very, very low vegetation that may occur after basically an event. So a flooding event, a fire is where natural jacks live. They literally live on nothing. Um, if you go up to Cumbria, where they live is on, it's literally <laughs> on what George Monbiot would call sheep wrecked bowling green. We actually think as well that wild boar, the rootles that wild boar make, would actually, uh, actually provide the breeding pools for this species right locations. So, so like free of um, fish that might eat their exactly, eggs and the yeah. tadpoles? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So natterjacks, that's exactly it. They only spawn in sort of small puddles. But they've got a very loud call. They're actually one of the loudest amphibians that occurs in Europe. Oh. Well, is that where their name comes from, nattering? Well, yeah, we think so. We think it means, yeah, so we think it means natter, which is obviously to talk, and then jack. We don't really know what the jack stands for, but it probably comes from an old word for toad, maybe. So that's a lovely species name, natterjack. I think it's just... just it's it seems perfect. Yeah, really well fitted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish more species would, you know, 
called that. I think Sand Lizard is such a boring name. I think <laughs> Maybe Sand Emerald, Dragon. Or, or yeah, oh yeah. Emerald Sand Dragon. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, that's a very good name, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, it's, that's my special. <laughs> <laughs> so why are amphibians and reptiles so important? Why do this in general? Yeah. Um, so reptiles and amphibians, they are the most threatened group of vertebrate spe species on Earth. Uh, the IUCN classes amphibians as the one that's declined the most um, since I think it's the 1970s. Um, amphibians and reptiles are incredibly important um, because they provide a food base. So in Britain, um, when you've, you've got this massive amount of biomass of species, you're feeding things like herons, storks, otters, even things like pike, um, and all this cum cumulative food um, just adds up to so much. So there's one study where they took 10 hectares of the marshland, which was relatively intact, you know, nice habitat. They weighed all the amphibians and they found that the total weight of all these amphibians um, added up to a, like the size of a black rhino every 10 hectares. My God. And 10 hectares is not very big at all. Um, so, you know, when we restore habitats and we put these species back, we are providing a lifeline for so many others. There's even some research showing that in forests in North America, um, salamanders and newts consume detritivores, which are things like earthworms and mealworms. And that co uh, consumption of these specific animals actually stores carbon because those animals would other otherwise proliferate in number and break down lots of organic material and release greenhouse gas. Mm. So by by basically keeping it, that just prol proliferates into soil instead and pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. So they provide absolutely massive, you know, import, important benefits to ecosystems and to, to ecosystem services to, you know, to humans. Um, so they're, they're very, very important. And in Britain, we've lost most of our native species um, and, and the ones which remain are very, very threatened. So we've got to do what we can, whether that is direct captive breeding and reintroduction, or whether that is, you know, education like we're doing now and spreading awareness. Um, and one of the things that we've, we always tell people is to dig a pond in your garden, you know, just add water and, and don't mow the grass. And if you really, if, you, if you've really got the time, add a log pile. You know, those small things added up together, you know, if everyone did that in their garden, we would be in such a better state for nature. So this is one of the sheds from one of our grass snakes. We shed probably yesterday and just put it out to dry. Um, and we've got some quite large grass snakes in here. You can tell the difference between grass snakes um, and adders because on the shed skin, adders, you can see a faint zigzag, whereas yeah. grass snakes you can't. And you can tell the difference again from smooth snakes because you can see in the middle of each scale there's a keel. Yeah. Whereas smooth snakes don't have their keel, hence being called smooth snakes. Um, so yeah, we'll see if there's actually a live one. Yeah, so we have the native barred grass snake. So these, these are found in the western. So they're basically what the press back in the press back in 2018 went mental saying that we have a new snake species here and uh, saying that we have an extra snake species because th what happened was the barred grass snake and you can see this one's barred um, was a subspecies of the common grass snake um, and then it got elevated to a full species status yeah. and so they, the press assumed that that meant there's an extra species of grass snake because there's a common one yeah. which is, but it wasn't, it's just that all grass snakes in the UK are now just a different species um, but yeah you can see it's our largest snake, it's an aquatic species so it does swim um, quite profusely, I mean you'll see them often in ponds and, and we've I've observed them in especially yeah, I, in Somerset. I've a lot of them in yeah. beds at home yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah. So. This one looks like it's ready to shed. Yes, this one, yeah. I think this one's a female as well. Um, She's absolutely gorgeous. But they're, they're not a small snake. I mean, they're, they're quite Oh big. no, I, I found one that's up over, it's nearly two meters long. Yeah, oh wow, yeah, uh, yeah. It's love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> one way, but you know. <laughs> so what troubles have you faced here? Have you faced any backlash or? Because yeah. it's a controversial topic, rewilding general. Yeah, massively. Um, I guess um, 
our main sort of interest of when was when the Guardian article went live, um, and that covered what what you know what our ambitions as, as a company and, and our ethos and that sort of thing. Um, and we did we got I mean literally counting the tweets we got like ninety five percent was really really nice and, and was really positive, but there was a lot of negativity I guess in some senses because looking back on it now in hindsight uh, we should have been a lot clearer in how we answered questions we want to uh, we'd love to see the escalating snake given some protection um, and allowed to expand because it was previously here however that was quoted as we want to reintroduce escalating snakes and it kind of painted us as, as almost like we were rogues and we were rebels and we were just going to breed loads of frogs and chuck them everywhere <laughs> with no idea about disease and all that sort of things. Um, and it kind of, it was in some ways amazing because it gave us an image and gave our brand a personalization and all that sort of thing. But at the same time, it, it attracted, you know, an amount of criticism. And the way that we dealt with criticism is you just got to be nice and acknowledge that people have got a point. Um, and sometimes you don't have to call out when it's bullshit you know and it just doesn't make any sense but um but for instance you know things like disease what we decided to do was allocate loads more funding to help with disease so we put in a new fence and predator control fencing we got all the animals tested using polymerase chain reaction tests and all that sort of thing um, but ultimately you've got i think one of the biggest things you've got to understand is that especially in conservation anyone who just who makes a change attracts criticism it really does not matter what it is you know there's so many people in there who you know in, in conservation who just don't really as bad as it sounds don't really have the vision to change and i think for so many rewilding helps because it allows us to work towards an end goal and i think you get a lot of people who are often middle class who've got a nice comfy job at a wildlife trust or the rspb and it doesn't really breed innovation that environment um it, you know, it may cause you not to mow the lawn, or but it keeps you in your lane, cruising in your lane. And I don't want to be there. I want to be mobile. I want to be able to affect change. And it's also the conservation institutions we've built are predicated almost on failure. You know, how are we the most nature depleted country in the world, yet we're one of the biggest economies in the world? You know, how have we got bare uplands where there's virtually no wildlife? How are we seeing declines of species which were once so common for instance to take an amphibian the common toad which has declined almost 70 percent in the last i think it's 25 years Jeez. you know how are hedgehogs so rare nowadays you know how has insects declined by 80 percent you know um conservation has seen successes it's seen wins but these are tiny compared to everything else and I think conservation organisations and people have got to take a good hard look at themselves because we're not, we're currently not winning. We aren't winning. So, change can often be perceived by conservation groups as, as um, rebellious. And I think that's, that's where that lies. But now, considering we've set up and we've set out our own intentions since and we're careful and we set good practice, even for things like welfare, etc., we don't really get any any of it we don't get it anymore and i just think that it's just because you're showing people that you mean business you know with what you want to do and you want to do it properly and we tried to just talk with emotion and with passion and whatever and i think it worked it got people's interests gets infectious fired up. yeah exactly yeah so these are britain's rarest amphibian these are called the northern pool frog and they've got one of the most fascinating stories of any British wildlife. Ever since the 1850s, um, water frogs were brought over to Britain to be released in, in, in usually stately homes in the ponds and things. And water frogs are a group of frogs found throughout Europe, which, as the name suggests, prefer to be aquatic. And they sit in water and around water. And for, for basically hundreds of years, thousands of water frogs were imported to, to also eat as well um, and to be in the pet trade and that meant that lots of populations of water frogs established all over Britain um, and the most famous one is, the, is a species known as the marsh frog and the marsh frog was established in Kent 
when the wife of an, uh, of an MP, and the MP was Edward Percy Smith, she brought him 12 marsh frogs over from Hungary and they put them in the pond. And the marsh frogs exploded now to the point where they're practically all over the southeast. They're not actually too big of an issue. I mean, lots of studies have shown that they don't really affect our native amphibians because they don't compete for the same foodstuffs and things. And also, in Europe, they live together with all of our native species anyway, yeah. to no avail. Um, but since the 70s, there was a weird population of water frogs known from a place um, called Thompson Common in, in, in Norfolk. And here, these brown pool frogs have been known since, well, s since prior to any reintroduction of water frogs in Britain. So it prompted um, investigation from two amazing naturalists, one called Charles Snell and another called David Billings. David Billings is, 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 a, is a wonderful man and he actually caught the last British pool frog. But unfortunately, as all this evidence was being gathered to suggest that they are actually native, um, the, the last one um, died. So it was, it was really, really sad. However, in due course in 2005, Swedish stock was imported, um, which is the closest match other than Norwegian animals to, to British pool frogs and have since been reintroduced. So it's very, very inspiring. Luckily, Lucky the pool frog, which was the last one ever to survive, bred with a Dutch pool frog female. And that meant that some progeny still exists. So there are some lucky animals in this group here, uh, but we also have a pure, uh, we're setting up a pure northern group as well. So that just basically means that uh, there is a bit of British genes in, in some of them. So, what is your favourite part of this job? Um, probably when animals breed, because it feels like an accomplishment. Um, obviously, animal instincts to breed are very sort of ingrained. So if an animal doesn't breed, it can be a sign that something is quite seriously wrong. So when they do breed, it's great, because it just feels like it's a good indication that it, you're doing something right. Um, and especially to add to that, when animals hatch out their eggs, it's just really, really, really amazing to see an animal's head peeping out of an egg. Oh. So in here we've got common lizards, and it's a very warm day for these. Um, the common lizards uh, are found in Britain, um, ironically not that common. Um, and we breed these because we would like to see um, sort of a more holistic way of mitigating against development for these guys. Um, there's lots of development sites where these are at, so we want to see whether, you know, if we reintroduce these to size, what the success rate of that reintroduction is, um, so that it can allow us to just be more holistic in the species management. So, yeah. so you can see there, she's really quite big. So, mm. so another name for these is the viviparous lizard, yes, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. So she'll give birth to, to live, live young. young. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Oh, there's another one. He's quite fat. Just a big newt, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful girl. Yeah, so this is the smooth snake. This is Britain's rarest species of snake. Um, and that's because it's relatively restricted to heathland sites in southern Britain. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful species of snake. It's, it's just very um, elegant and muted. It's not showy or flashy or anything. Um, and it is, although there is contention about this, it is, um, it does consume reptiles, so um, that's why it's restricted to heathen is because it pretty much eats reptiles. And actually, interestingly, you can see the smooth snake has um, an almost zigzag like an adder, yeah. because it tries to emulate an adder slightly, um, and that's also sort of like the collar as well. Beautiful. A very rare snake, this one. And a very pretty snake. Yeah, we're just looking forward to getting the female, which will be fun. So, of the species um, you have here and have had in the past, yeah, um, is there a large amount that you've released back into the wild? So, at the moment, we're working on feasibility studies, um, and reintroductions ultimately are complex. They um, require a lot of planning and and looking at the legislation to see what 
you know you can do and what you can't do and what you need licenses for and everything and and this takes time and so does the habitat because often one of the things we're noticing is the habitat is just simply not there yeah it's just one of those things that's very hard other species we're doing translocation projects so that means we're moving them from mitigation sites um, and experimenting with if we can breed them in captivity and then re-release the young it actually increases the viability or common lizards as well they are going to different rewilding projects where they're augmenting potentially already existing populations for a genetic boost um, and the thing is there's lots of things with reintroductions to juggle so disease risk legislation and those sorts of things and habitat suitability are all three things so we're, we're, we're doing a, you know a lot of feasibility to see what's possible um, but they're so you know the, the reintroductions are not as binary as what people think either, either so for instance European pontils what we're doing is doing a project to see whether they can breed in the wild however in a captive setting by using sandbanks at a site so that they can lay their eggs to see whether they'll hatch so there's lots of different stuff like this that augments, you know, wild releases and that sorts of things. And and ultimately, you know, um, it's all it all revolves around rewilding and habitat. You know, our company is predicated on getting as much land online and in a process of regeneration as possible. Or else, there's, you know, there's almost no point doing reintroductions. Um, um, so, so yeah, I guess. Um, you know, there's so, so many balls to juggle, it's just not as easy as... That's it, you know, going back to the question about what you said about the media is, we never, you know, we never said that we wanted to very, very easily chug, you know... Just throw a snake from. in a bush exactly. and it's all done. Yeah, yeah it's, there's so much more to this, there's so much more nuance. But that's great, because that's where the real work is, is, is working with landowners to get land online, mm. so... So in here we've got our pure northern tree frogs and basically European tree frogs are really interesting because they used to they used to be thought to be found from Spain to the coast of Japan but it turns out that actually they are multiple different species which are known as a cryptic species so that means that they look very similar but genetically are very different and because of this for ages captive keepers had mixed animals so they inadvertently created hybrids so that meant there was no pure European tree frogs in captivity. So we've secured a group of these um, and basically we want to breed pure ones basically to improve the captive stock. Um, and um, it is a lesson in conservation that shows that, you know, sometimes it's best to ensure that you are breeding your animals from quite a close geographic area, not being too worried about, um, you know, inbreeding because you know, the, these animals, um, there's so many cryptic species now that are being discovered that, you know, what was thought to be a species can end up being seven, you know, the next day. So, yeah, we've got about 20 of these tree frogs in here. Um, and it, again, it's just been so warm that they, they've started to sort of hunker down. Um, they're usually up on these branches, um, whereas, yeah, now they're just sort of hanging down in the, in the low bush so so this is yeah. cause there's an argument lately where the genetics is useful for conservation or not or like what's exactly so yeah this would be one of the yeah good things i think so i mean um european tree frogs with we are thought to be native um and basically the re they've been introduced by victorians in the past and the reason why it hadn't worked is they were probably using the wrong species so Yes, it is. Genetics is important, and um, you know we we need to use you know the latest science on how we do reintroductions just from so that we're efficient. You know, so yeah. Mm. And one day, hopefully, we'll have these back. So why Celtic reptile and amphibian? Uh, it's a nice name. I think the thing is with a lot of conservation groups and operations and projects and funds and whatever, is they're called like the you know, environment protection, uh, understanding um, applications, project fund, and uh, it just sounds like boring. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, no offence, but RSPB, <laughs> it doesn't sing environment, doesn't sing no. harmony with nature, it doesn't sing. So Celtic, it's just 
what it is is it's to try and get people's semantics thinking back to that time um, without being you know too uh, general you know without being making too many generalizations the Celts were probably the last hunter gatherers in Europe so when there was a time when we weren't necessarily living in harmony because even as hunter gatherers we were white we'd wiped out the mammoths the woolly rhinos whatever mm. um, but we we were a lot you know, we, the more ecologically wasn't on fire, stable. You know, yeah. um, and so it's to try and get people to think back then. We can never go back in time. We can't, and rewilding shouldn't ever really about recreating the past. It should be about new ecosystems. The Dutch call it new nature, which means new nature. About, but ultimately, all these interactions that happen in the future are embedded in the past. That's what people. You know, the reason why the beaver increases biodiversity. It's because the beaver has always been there and, and everything's evolved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a bug flew right into my nose. Rewilding. <laughs> it's okay, um, the bug was, it was an actor. It's not harmed. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's about, it's about resuming ecological processes. So that, that's where the name comes from. It's just to try and be a bit more interesting. Um, and I try and, we, we, when we do other little things, I just try and be a bit more creative with naming just to just so it's interesting oh people you know so that people ask that very question yeah, exactly. why the name and it catches you know, on more yeah, than like exactly you can't say the the royal protection yeah, of yeah, something yeah. is yeah. a big mouthful yeah and it, celtic yeah. reptile amphibian yeah it's yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, very yeah. good awesome one of our most famous animals one of my favorites as well <laughs> is the european pontil and i will just get them to come over and feed that one climbing out on the bank now that's he's called hugh um, and he he's the dominant male of this group so there is a bit of a pecking order i'd say similar to chickens i don't know if you've if have you got chickens you keep chickens uh, i used to yeah well you know how there's a pecking order with chicken it's very similar with turtles i find this one's swimming over now this is not actually a european pond turtle but this is a caspian pond turtle all right i found in the caspian basin which is um which I think is Russia, that area. And um, another name they go by is the striped necked terrapin because you can see we've got striped neck. But the pond turtle was found in Britain, um, sort of, we think, until the Roman times because what, what really was the final nail in the coffin for this species was deteriorate, deteriorating climate around the time that the Romans invaded Britain and that meant that it couldn't incubate its eggs. So a lot of people ask us, well, what's the point in reintroducing it then if the climate's changed? Well, if you've not been living under a rock, you'll know that the climate is actually changing again due to human means, and it's mm. very, very scary. And what we would love to do is investigate to see whether the European pond turtle can breed in Britain again so that we can help to maintain its species because it's already a threatened species globally. And if we can help to increase its range to its previous native st uh, area, then that can only be a good thing. We're going to see so many horrendous losses um, mm. in, in the next you know, century due to climate change. So if we can forge just, even if it's just a tiny bit of hope, you know, that, that, that will go a very, very long way. So we would love to, to get this species back um, and reintroduced. That, so, that's another, that's a female pond turtle. It's so, under there, and that one there is Russian. He's he's from Russia, ironically. So are they all the same? What well, apart from the? Um, yeah, there's, there's three cats in there. Oh, look at that one over there coming out. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> so you want to come over here? Give a bit of water. I'll eat my fingers. <laughs> what a little nightmare. <laughs> a good nightmare. So, weirdly as well, when we're talking about pool frog clades, these are also similar. So pond turtles very, are very variable throughout their geographic range. So this one is, is haplotype 1A, and these are found in Belarus, Russia, and these are like totally black, or almost totally black, as you can see. And the males have got red eyes. 
Whereas Hugh, he's probably, um, we think he's probably from that Italy region area. Um, originally anyway. So yeah, you can see that, although they're the same species, they vary a lot dependent on where they're from. Yeah, because the one I have at home, it's got like more stripes on the back mm. and um, definitely a lot lighter in yeah, colour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, okay, okay. Oh, it's so got one over here. There we go. Be free. It's <laughs> kind of stopping him going in there. <laughs> so, what are the plans for the future of Celtic reptile and amphibian? So there are two parts of this that um, you know we're, we're looking into the future, and I, and I believe as a person you only really function correctly if you are thinking about the future. Um, with Celtic reptile and amphibian, its primary uh, primary aims is to get a big area of land online being restored. You know, using our expertise and others to make sure that we're creating space for nature, and with that aim comes to reintroduce all of our lost and extinct native reptiles and amphibians and um, you know like we've, we've shown you but then this fits into a bigger part um, and ethos which is restoring nature using reintroductions and rewilding what we want to do is to you know think how can we pragmatically save species and the reality is that if we want to be rewilding we, we don't have the time the wildlife trusts have said that within 10 years we just don't, won't have the background wildlife to restore areas of land. So we're going to need to reintroduce stuff that we never imagined that we may need to reintroduce. A friend of mine is reintroducing got, uh, glow worms and, and you know even water voles you would never have thought back in the 50s would need to be reintroduced. So there's all of these different elements that make you think actually this is just the start, this is just the beginning of something that I hope is much bigger and much far reaching. Imagine, you know, if we lived in a country where in every region the, there were these national nature centres which, you know, bred and released and educated, you know, people about different wildlife. That would be something. If we are talking about these vast areas of land going into rewilding, we need a supply of wildlife without sounding sinister. Yes, things are going to survive, but a lot of things are going to perish, especially with things like climate change, you know, ocean acidification, uh, sea level rise, you know, all sorts of existential crises. So we need to build resilience. And I think, you know, you very quickly get to an idea that captive breeding is going to be vital um, in a meaningful way. So what I'm saying in essence is this is just the start and we've got no plans on stopping anytime soon nor should you <laughs> thanks oh, fantastic <laughs> right so thank you all for viewing if you want to check out more from celtic reptile and Fibbing, you yeah. can find them on uh, well we're on facebook twitter instagram and youtube if you type celtic reptile and amphibian in any of those it should come up uh, but most importantly if you would love to support us that that we would you know, really appreciate that. You can go to our Patreon, um, which I think is uh, www.patreon.co.uk slash Celtic Reptile. Um, if not, type in Celtic Reptile and I'll give you a Patreon. It'll come up, and if whatever you've got would be absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure the links are I was going to say in the description below. Yeah. <laughs> Standard YouTube stuff. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having yeah, us. No worries. It's been great to meet you. Awesome. Awesome. I hope you've enjoyed this deep look into Celtic Reptile and Amphibian with us today. If you'd like to find out more about what they do, or want to support them, all the links are in the description below. A special thanks to Harvey and the gang for allowing us to come up and do this video. And an additional thanks to Curtis Lane, fellow zoologist, for helping me out making this. You can check out his channel, Ocean's Fury, which is also in the description below. All media used in this video are solely for educational purpose, and are protected under Creative Commons. I hope to see you all again soon. Remember to stay informed and connected to nature.